welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome the audience, the church, the pastors, and everyone here this morning. Uh, particularly our visitors. I just want to introduce our speaker once again, uh, Pastor Mackenzie, uh, uh, King David. Uh, Pastor Mackenzie, we're happy to have you here. We are truly blessed. Everyone is blessed here, I'm sure. Can attest to that we are all blessed and we're looking forward to hear from you once again. Uh, thank you so much for accepting the call to come and minister to us. I uh, just want to, uh, to give you that honor, Pastor, to take us to the throne this morning. Thank you. I greet you this morning in the reigning, redeeming, and soon returning name of King Jesus the Christ. Yesterday, we were disappointed by David's silence, but today we'll be encouraged by David's song. Now, this song of David is significant because it was composed and vocalized at a time when David's future seemed uncertain, uh, when he had immense pressure externally, and when he was experiencing insecurity internally. And David's son, Absalom, the outlaw who was responsible for the death of his half-brother Amnon, for raping his sister Tamar is back in Israel. And again, he's up to no good. Absalom wants the throne of David. He wants to be king. And so he incites an insurrection and a rebellion in Israel. King David, not wanting to have Jerusalem, the city of peace, become the setting and scene of a civil war, leaves his throne. He, he leaves his palace. He leaves his city as Absalom continues to pursue and persecute him. Just like with Amnon, Absalom wants David dead. And so whilst fleeing from his son Absalom, David composes the eight verses that we find in Psalm chapter three. This is David's song. As you're turning in your Bibles to Psalm chapter three, let me tell you about this psalm. It's a special psalm because it has many firsts. It's the first psalm with a heading. It's the first psalm to be called a psalm. It's the first psalm which identifies its author. And you would see that it's the first psalm which tells us of its occasion and historical setting. Psalm chapter three is also special because it includes the first occurrences of the word Salah. The word Salah appears 71 times in the book of Psalms. Here we see the word Salah appear three times in Psalm chapter three. At the end of verse two, if you're already there in Psalm three, you'll see it at the end of verse four and at the end of verse eight. Now, scholars are not entirely and absolutely certain about the exact meaning of the word Salah, but it's generally thought to indicate a pause in the music. This calls for the worshipper to spend time in meditation and reflection. And so by following the appearance of Salah in this chapter, we see that Psalm chapter three is naturally divided into three sections. Verses one to two is the first section. Verses three to four is the second section. And verses five through to eight is the third and final sections. And so we'll use these three sections of Psalm 3 to give us three life lessons on how to pray when things are difficult. Psalm chapter 3, the first section, verses 1 and 2, reads, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Everyone knew David's business. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and all this was public knowledge. And so David complains, God will not save me, they say. God will not deliver me, they declare. God will not rescue me, they retort. God will not preserve me, they predict. God will not protect me, they profess. Salah. That's how the first section ends. But don't miss how David begins his prayer. Oh, Lord, he says. And so here is the first lesson you need to learn. You must bring your complaints before God. You must bring your complaints 
before God. Don't take your complaints to people who can't do anything. Take them to God who can do everything. Yes, all of Israel knew of David's sin, but he doesn't confide in his royal counselors. He doesn't unburden to his palace advisors. He doesn't speak to his soldiers. No, David brings his complaints before God. Oh Lord, David cries, many, that's number one, are my enemies. Many, that's number two, rise up against me. Many, that's number three, say God will not deliver me. David tells God that his enemies are what, what his enemies are doing and what his enemies are saying. Understand that this is David's prayer at night. It's his song in the night. He's not only surrounded by the physical darkness that nighttime brings, but he's in a mentally and emotionally and in a psychologically dark place. All around him is dark. But this is the same David who wrote in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me, even then will I be confident. This confidence, this assurance, this providence is expressed and exhibited in the next section of Psalm chapter 3. But David not only brings his complaints before God, he puts his confidence in God. The Bible says, you are my shield. You're my protective barrier from the hurt and the harm my enemies want to inflict and afflict upon me. But David teaches us that we can and, and should and must put our trust in God. And the king gives us two reasons why. Firstly, because of who God is. That's in verse three. You're still in Psalm chapter three. Uh, and secondly, because of what God has done, that's in verse four. Now, the King James Version says in verse three, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. And whilst that sounds good, that God is our defense against the fiery darts of the enemy, uh, that he is the screen that protects us from the adversary's aggression. I'm glad that this is not the best translation for this verse. For whilst the KJV says that God is a shield for me, the NIV affirms that the Lord is a shield around me. Come on now, I'm going to enjoy this all by myself. But even when the enemy surrounds me, impounds me, and confounds me, God is a shield all around me. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. He says it best when he declares, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. And for that reason, we can disregard what others are saying about us and direct our attention to who God is. God is not only our defender and protector all around us, but in the same verse, God is my glory. Ah, this is an important point because David's self-worth and self-esteem was not in his throne or in his position, which both seem to be lost, but his confidence was in God. David recognizes that human glory may be the result of status, wealth, or knowledge, but God's glory is unreachable and unimpeachable. The reason why this is so significant and relevant for you today is that you may lose worldly stuff the flattery of people, the prestige of position, the comfort of possessions. You can lose all that stuff, but God. Uh, I wish I had an online witness right now. Uh, God will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And so whilst people may bad mouth you and backstab you, whilst your possessions may disappear, disintegrate and evaporate, our God is our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal hope. And because he is our glory, 
And because he will never leave us, our value and our worth will never subside. It, it will never downgrade. It will never diminish. David had experienced the fickleness of close friends and family members and how the tide of public opinion could quickly change. But God is not only our shield, he's not only our glory, but in the very same verse, he is the lifter up of our heads. David's head was down because of his sorrow and despair, and perhaps this posture reminded him of how victims appeared before him when he actually as judge in his royal courts. The accused would come with head bowed down, awaiting for his verdict as judge. If the defendant was guilty, David as the supreme justice would symbolize their guiltiness by placing his foot on the convict's neck. But if the victim was innocent or indeed pardoned by the king, David would lift up the victim's head. David, who appears before God, not as judge, but as the accused, professes that it is God, the only righteous judge of man, who is the lifter up of his head. And so in the same psalm that David declares, the Lord is my light and my salvation, David proclaims in verse 6, and now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. And so even though he complains to God that his enemies are many, David puts his confidence in God because God is his shield. Even though he complains to God that his enemies are many, David puts his confidence in God because God is his glory. Even though he complains to God that his enemies are many, David puts his confidence in God because God is the lifter up of his head. But David's not done. We can put our confidence in God because of who he is in verse three, but additionally and emphatically and encouragingly because of what he has done in verse four. Verse four reads, to the Lord I cry aloud and he answers me from his holy hill, Salah. We know why David is praying. He's being persecuted by Absalom. We know when David is praying. It's during the middle of the night. We know where David is praying. It's as he's crossing the Jordan River. And we know how David is praying. He's crying with a loud voice. But allow me to suggest to you today that more significant than David's posture in prayer or location of prayer or volume of prayer is the fact that God not only hears his prayers, but God asks answers his prayers. David had prayed, God had answered. In the first verse of the third and final section of Psalm 3, David says, I lay down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. Now, if you've never had any problems, this verse won't mean anything to you. If you've never had a sleepless night and not a care in the world, not a worry on your mind, then this verse isn't for you. But in case you have, David reminds us that it's not a soft mattress or a fluffy pillow or silent surroundings that allows you to sleep. It's the Lord who sustains you. I remember it was last year. My wife, Joy, had woken me up because she had heard some faint banging coming from what she thought was the outside kitchen door. Do you hear that? She asked. I had been sound asleep and now that I was awake, I still couldn't hear anything. I paused to listen and still heard nothing. It was probably nothing. But to ensure that my wife's heart and mind was at ease so that she could go back to sleep and so that I could go back to sleep, I jumped out of bed put on my glasses and I went to investigate. The inside kitchen door was closed, so I tilted my head towards it and pressed my ear against it. I was confident that I would be able to return to my wife, Joy, with the report that I had thoroughly inspected our residence and the coast was clear. Everything was safe and sound. And so as I listened to what I suspected would be the sound of silence, my pressed up ear, became my pricked up ear. It wasn't a banging noise I heard. It was the sound of the security gate slowly but surely squeakily opening. This meant that the outside kitchen door had already been breached. There was an intruder in my house, an uninvited and unwelcome guest. 
I swung the kitchen door open quickly and fiercely and screamed at the top of my lungs, what are you doing? I'd like to think that my shouting was reminiscent of the time Joshua and the children of Israel shouted and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, uh, but I shouted and nothing happened. I could see the silhouette of two figures, one an arm's length from me and the other blocking the entrance of the outside kitchen door. They were probably more shocked to see me than I was to see them, but it was too dark for me to make out any facial features. Besides, they were wearing masks and it wasn't because of COVID-19. These masks were concealing their identity. Things had happened so fast and even though I had shouted, nothing happened. They didn't move, they didn't say anything, so I moved towards them. Was this an act of bravery or stupidity? I still don't know. I didn't have time to think, but in moving towards them, they retreated. But only until they were outside the house, I began to give chase, but still they hesitated and lingered until they finally decided to disappear into the dark of the night. I later saw that the reason why they had not fled immediately was because they had left an ax which they had wanted to retreat. The irony was they had come to take from me, but instead they left something for me. This ax which had given them entry to my home, this ax which could have been used as a weapon to cause injury, this ax which was covered with their fingerprints was now in my possession. The police came not too long after and recovered this evidence. And even though the security had arrived after the incident, I knew that through this ordeal, God had been with me. He had delivered me and my family from injury. He had woken joy up in time to wake me up in time so that I could open the door in time to ensure that no harm would befall us. And whilst we would much rather not have had our home broken into and entered into, what we saw and experienced in the dark that night was God's ability to protect. He had been protecting all along in the past, but it was unseen and unknown. Now our eyes had been open. The only thing that was stolen that night was our sleep. But it wasn't just that night. The trauma from that experience meant that we were robbed of our sleep the next night and the next night and the next night. Days became weeks and weeks became a month. And even though there were now three separate locks on the outside kitchen door, one for the father, one for the son, and one for the Holy Ghost, even though there was now a new padlock on that burglar gate, even though two new security gates were installed in the house and a security light outside of the house, our safety, security, and surety were not met in those man-made alarm systems, not in newly acquired metal padlocks, not even in trained and armed security guards located near our premises. Still, I was awake during the dark night hours, wondering if the noise I had just heard was the result of wind blowing or another uninvited visitor seeking to gain access to my residence. I was a prisoner in my own home. I sought to turn this unfortunate situation into an advantageous one, utilizing the time of the night to answer emails, to do some planning, to do some praying and do more reading. Whilst my wife, daughter and son slept, I sat there awake. Is this what was meant by watching and praying? I was busy working on my laptop, flashlight to one side and my newly purchased baseball bat on my other side. I had joked with joy that I should have inscribed on this bat, this weapon formed against you will prosper. I determined that it was better for me to give than to receive. But as I contemplated and meditated on the faithfulness of my friend called Jesus, I concluded that the hymn writer was right. God will take care of me. I had already spent time talking to God in prayer, but now was the time for me to listen and to pay attention to the voice of the shepherd. And so instead of counting sheep so that I could sleep, I counted the shepherd's promises. A promise number one, Psalm 34, verse seven, the angel of the Lord 
world encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. A promise number two, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 3, that the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. A promise number three, Psalm 17 verse 8 and 9, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who are out to destroy me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. Promise number four, Isaiah 41 verse 10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Promise number five, Ephesians 6 verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Uh, promise number six, Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. A promise number seven, uh, Psalm 121 verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Promise number 8, Psalm 32 verse 7, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Uh, promise number 9, Nahum 1 verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And promise number 10, 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I told myself that night, my God neither slumbers nor sleeps. There's no need for both of us to be awake. And so I closed my eyes, knowing that he is a sheep all around me. I went to sleep in the name of Jesus and with the presence, the power and the peace that his promises bring. Uh, I can happily report to you that there was some sanctified snoring that night. Uh, David says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Now I have to repeat it because I think you missed it. Uh, David says, I lay down. I went to sleep and I woke again. <laughs> You're still not getting it. Uh, David recognizes that his enemies are many, many and many. Because God is his glory, he can go to sleep. And because God is the lifter up of his head, he can wake again. And for that reason, along with David, I can say, praise the Lord. In the last two verses of Psalm David, uh, David says, as I'm closing, arise, Lord, deliver me, O God, strike all my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people, Salah. David calls for God to fight on his behalf. And here we have the third and final lesson from Psalm chapter three. Whilst lesson number one is bringing our complaints before God. Whilst lesson number two is putting our confidence in God. Lesson number three is giving our conflicts to God. David requests, arise, O Lord. In other words, intervene in my situation, intercede on my behalf, interrupt the enemy's evil intentions and interfere with their wicked plans. Uh, David's call for God to break the teeth of the enemy uh, was not to save him from trouble because he was already in trouble. It was to deliver him in the midst of this trouble. This enemy was like a lion and he had already been taken as it were in the predator's mouth. But if God would strike the jaws of the enemy and if their teeth were broken, then he would be able to escape unscathed. And so the breaking of his enemy's jaw is not David's plea to destroy and devastate them, but it's a call to deliver him. David affirms and confirms, contrary to the comments of his adversaries, that deliverance comes from God. Salvation comes from God. And whatever your situation or condition this morning, God can save you. How do I know God can save you? Because his grace is sufficient. Because his love is everlasting. Because his power is unlimited. Because his wisdom is perfect. And because his name is wonderful. Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And so because God delivers and because God blesses, you can bring your complaints before God. You can put your confidence in God and you can give your conflicts to God. This time where you are, I'm going to invite you just to bow your heads with me, with this in mind as we seek him out in prayer. Father God, we praise you for who you've been and what you've done in our lives. Our protector, 
our provider, our preserver, our promise keeper and peace giver. We thank you for being powerful, personal and patient in our lives. And we pray that you would continue to safeguard us, not only from physical dangers seen and unseen, but from pride and lust and jealousy and covetousness. We affirm today that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so may our trust in you and our confidence in your word always give us pause and reason to sing praises to you. We prayed these things humbly in the name of Jesus, our shield and shelter in the time of storm. Amen. Amen.